Hi, and welcome to the Team Deacons podcast. This podcast is a dialogue between Roger and James Deacons, joined by Matt Wyman, starting from a submitted question and ending who knows where. We're also joined by guests on occasion. We're connecting through Zoom, so bear that in mind when you hear the audio. If you'd like to submit a question, please do so by emailing pod, P-O-D, at rogerdeacons.com. We're pleased today to have with us a director known to you all. He's a great friend, which adds to the pleasure of working with him. We've collaborated on three movies with him and have had a lot of fun along the way. A few of his titles are Ensemble, Prisoners, Sicario, Arrival, and Blade Runner 2049. And, of course, we're all impatiently awaiting his film, Dune. We're very happy to welcome a magnificent director and a good friend, Denis Villeneuve. Denis, thank you. Thank you, James. That was a lovely introduction. Thank you very much. Can you just start it out with uh, telling us how, what your path was, how you ended up where you are today? I will try to be brief. I studied film in Montreal. At the end of the, that study, I felt that I learned how to put a camera on a tripod and to lit on, a, on the stage, but I, I felt the, the urge to uh, bring the camera in the streets and outside. And I did uh, something that was very important in my, uh, my studies, which was to spend... Uh, half a year around the world alone with a, a digital little camera, uh, doing documentaries for a French branch of CBC called Radio-Canada. So I spent uh, seven months ah. alone doing uh, every, every week uh, a short film of five minutes, uh, a little essay with total freedom. And those short films were aired uh, on the prime time on national TV. It was like a kind of little competition between eight people, between 18 and 25 years old. And I had the chance to participate uh, to that. And that was very, very, uh, one of the greatest uh, experience uh, as a film student, because uh, I really learned how to approach um, a subject with a camera alone, being in the intimacy with the camera and a subject, and to, to learn about light too, and to learn about uh, storytelling too, about because the documentary is a fantastic way to learn about uh, how to, to structure a story. What did you film? Can I can I interrupt there? What what did you film on the which what, what subjects kind of documentary? and what kind of films oh, did boy, you? Oh boy, it was it was different. Uh, <laughs> uh, frankly, Roger, uh, it was uh, different from one country to the other. I, I remember in uh, Jakarta, I did a, a what I thought a beautiful movie about a knife maker that was making beautiful knives. But uh, I think that the, I'm more remembered for my failures. <laughs> <laughs> like I did, I, I, I did, I, I did a movie once. I was in the desert and I was like uh, without subject because uh, the time was very compressed. And I, I decided to make a reflection about documentary and subject, the relationship of the filmmaker and his subject using Beatles. There was the, the desert was filled with Beatles, and I started to create a story about those Beatles and my relationship with them and how my rights to wow. describe their life. But I, I, I know that people, uh, 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 when I came back, were keep talking about that short film of the Beatles and the one I did about Tibet, also one that I did in Tibet, about uh, mm -hmm. Tibetan life and their relationship over there and, uh, and landscape. But those were five. I was 20 years old and I was making it. It was like very uh, naive, and, but there was something beautiful about the freedom of these yeah. After, at the end of this process, I, I did a, uh, had a job at the National Film Board for uh, two years where I did my first short film, uh, a professional short film there, a documentary in Jamaica, and it's about culture shock. And, but that's, I would say that's what is singular about my journey, is that immersion in a documentary that really changed my approach of cinema. And, and still today, when I'm uh, with the film crew, when I design a shot with a cinematographer, I'm trying to always go back to that intimacy where I was just alone with the, the camera and not thinking about all the film crew and uh, just trying to find back that intimacy, that pleasure. Yeah. Well, it certainly explains, too, why you're, um, you're very visual when we're talking about shots and you also are very strong in knowing how you're going to cut it. Um, so you oftentimes have the strength and courage to say, no, we don't need to do coverage but it's because a, you a, know. It's a good comment, James, because it's it's true that uh, through the, the, the way we were doing this, it was before internet, so we had to edit on paper. 
So it was really, really it was really like an exercise of, of memory and uh, uh, how to um, do mental editing. It was, honestly, for film students, I would recommend to do this uh, because it's like it, it, it teaches you uh, how to design a shot. Uh, and I'm still learning today. It's, just, it's just one of the great strengths of Roger to uh, know how to design a shot according to the structure of the scene. And it's something I'm, I'm still learning, but I, I, I remember having, uh, having learned a lot doing this exercise about editing yeah, a lot. So after you did those, what did you do? Uh, I thought that this podcast would be about Roger, but let's go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you oh, can no. always oh, turn no, it no, around no. that way. <laughs> it's up to you. You can change the questions. No, 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 no. no <laughs> I'm joking. The, the thing is that uh, after that, I, I did that short film, mm -hmm. but uh, I felt the urge to, to do something. Uh, the National Film Board was like an institution. For those who don't know, it's, it's a governmental institution in Canada that is very well known for its animated we see animated little short films every year at the Academy Awards, or it's documentaries. A lot of very strong filmmakers from Canada were born in that institution, all of them, in fact. And I had the chance to, to work with some of them, uh, uh, being one of their assistants, uh, and then to make my own short film. I learned a lot, but when I, uh, I was there, I felt that there was a rhythm, there was something about, there's a weight, and a weight of history, and I was uh, looking for for going towards fiction and to work with people of my own age and, and uh, the friends. And so I, I left this institution and went to do rock videos, which was like a great bad idea because it's like I didn't like it. <laughs> but what I loved was the ability to have an idea and to see the result two weeks later. At the National yeah. Film Board, you have an idea and you see the result two or three years later. It was like uh, I, I could, at that when you're 23 years old, it was not a yeah. thing that was suitable for me. So I did a few short rock videos where I learned mostly how to deal with the pressure of a film crew, how to communicate to a film crew. It has nothing to do with cinema, but at least there was the tools of cinema. And uh, then I um, had the chance there at the time, there was one of the great producers in, in uh, Quebec, uh, Roger Frappier, wanted to, do, to, to meet the new generation of filmmaker. And he, he had uh, the idea to do a feature film made out of six short films that will be uh, uh, directed by six different, different directors, but shoot by the film, same film crew. And oh. I, I, I did that, that uh, feature film with the five other directors. And it was a fantastic experience because this is the only time in my life that I had the chance to work with other directors without feeling any kind of competition. We were mm -hmm. storyboarding together, we were editing together, we were even uh, going on the set of the other directors, helping them as assistant. So it was, again, another part of my film school. And this movie uh, called Cosmos was like uh, had a, a nice little uh, uh, critical success. And the producer at the end of this uh, project said to me, said to all of us, in fact, if you want to do a, your first feature film, I'm there. I love working with you all and I would like to do it again. And me. I jumped on the uh, opportunity. I mean, uh, Roger Frappier uh, is one of, honestly, one of the best and most influenced film producer in, in Canada. So it was, it was like, and I, I jumped and I did uh, my first feature. And from there, I, had, I was very lucky. I, say. I was very lucky to, to, to uh, meet Roger. Yeah. Denis, um, you had talked about film school, how you kind of learned to pick up a camera and you went on these documentaries and you were shooting. At one point, did you realize that you wanted to take the path of a director and learn story more rather than be a cameraman or go to cinema, be a cinematographer? Like I, 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 I uh, since the beginning, was a, I was attracted to storytelling. It was always driven by the idea of uh, telling stories, to uh, approach reality with a story, and to try to bring something out of it or the poetry of storytelling. So I never thought I would be a cinematographer. And very quickly, when I started to work with bigger film crew, I, I felt that uh, other people were far better than me to use it, to manipulate the camera or with the lighting. I was cinematographer on short films sometimes, or, or uh, I did some cinematography myself, but it's not something that uh, I was like, uh, I felt in love with. Yeah, I, it was always directing, always, always writing and directing that I attracted. Since the beginning, your work's very personal, and the way you're talking about your beginnings and your attitude to your work, it's very personal. How did you, how did that kind of, how did that work when you started 
having to work with bigger crews and with cinematographers and all the rest. But the thing is that uh, uh, my first uh, movies were made with a, a very close friend of mine, Henri Turpin. That was like a kind of brother. We were raised together, and he was like, a, a, I mean, a, as film students, and that. Uh, aesthetically, we were really uh, uh, stimulated by each other. It's like, and, and uh, so that kind of relationship uh, uh, re uh, very early on was uh, Henri shot three of my feature, my feature films at the beginning, and uh, four. In fact, I made four movies with him. I think that will be the key because uh, uh, I feel that, like any director, I guess the relationship with a cinematographer is the most intimate and precious. An, an important thing on a set. I mean, it's like uh, your eyes and your movement and your rhythm, and uh, you have to just. It, it was frankly, it was born in a friendship. I want to say the mm -hmm. idea to go from mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. being alone with a camera and then to share a camera with a friend and uh, to trust right. him and, and uh, to realize that he was far better than me. <laughs> <laughs> and, but uh, is it really? It's really important then to be working with somebody that has a sort of similar sensibility. Then, really, that is. I think it's uh, otherwise. It's it can be very painful. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's like uh, that's the key. You have to work with someone that uh, will uh, be an extension. Not an it's, it's, uh, it's like a dance. You know, there's no other way. Yeah. I don't feel that. Uh, you don't think having somebody who thinks completely differently would push you more or like have a different sensibility that can still add to the project or is it too separate? I did a movie once where I, I worked with someone that had a different sensibility and I, 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 it's true that I learned in some ways, but uh, making movies is too hard. <laughs> you have to yeah. have a ground, you have to, uh, to have to, uh, there's too many elements. There's too many uh, uh, aspects of the film process I feel that I learned stories of friends working with cinematographer where they clashed. And frankly, I don't feel it was productive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I feel that there's nothing more joyful than to share the camera with someone where you feel that uh, you are spontaneously embracing a scene. Uh, there's something. It doesn't mean that you will approach the scene the same way. It doesn't seem mean that the other person will not bring different ideas, but it's just that the perspective on a scene, the, the, the point of view on a scene will be shared. I mean, when I work with uh, André, when I, or when I had the chance to work with Roger, there's multiple times we, we approach uh, there was different ideas, but it, it um, just uh, sharing the same sensibility, I think it's a I can't. I don't think I can do it. Uh, other way. It's, yeah, it's too I think difficult. I think there's a there's a difference between a, sharing a sensibility and sharing the exact idea of a shot, isn't mm -hmm. there? You know, yeah, you exactly. can have a you can have a conflict of ideas, but not a conflict of sensibility, if yeah. you like. If the, the sort of goal is the same, the kind of the kind of feel of it, the kind of tone. But you think you need to be in sync, you know. You, uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, uh, working with uh, directors, uh, you uh, did it happen that you had like uh, working with uh, uh, directors that had different sensibilities and uh, it was productive? Is it something that? Well, you try and figure out the sensibility before you accept the <laughs> yeah, job. Before you go into you, it, no, yeah. you do because you can always do a script five different ways. So you want to meet with them and see if they're thinking of basically the same idea that you are. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I was really touched when you s used the phrase, share the camera with someone. That's a really lovely way of looking at it. Yeah, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, just what it is, isn't it? Yeah. I wondered if, if you'd like to talk a bit more about the earlier films you did in Canada and the style of the, those films and what you, were, what you were looking for. I mean, because they're quite different, weren't they? There was Maelstrom, <laughs> right, which is kind yeah. of out there and then there's <laughs> polytechnic which is very different uh, and then there's on can yeah, you it's, talk it's, about them a little bit what you were looking it, for it's, yeah the thing is uh it, there's they have all something in common first of all I, 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 I need to say that when i did that experience of going around the world i made i think 22 or 25 short films five minutes mm -hmm. that were edited in montreal and I did my best every time to do like small documentaries that were quite experimental, uh, sometimes very bad, sometimes 
good, and, and but I always thought they would be very different. When I came back, after all those months, I had the chance to look at them back to back. It was the first time I was looking at them with music and everything, and, and they all look the same. And it was like a, a, trauma, a trauma for me. And I know that every time I'm making a movie, I'm trying to do something to approach things differently. And still today, sometimes I'm making shots and I'm saying, asking to myself, am I an automatic pilot? Because I have an urge, <laughs> urge to cut the scene this way. I have an urge to make that camera movement right now. But I, it's like a, uh, something that is a deep intuition, but it's something that it, at the beginning, I think I was looking, it was uh, honestly, frankly, I was struggling with the cinematic identity. I'm meaning that you're like uh, uh, trying to find your voice. And I know that my t two first movies had numerous influences and they were made quite in a clumsy way, but there was always this idea in the fourth, first movie to be immersive, to try to bring the audience into an experience uh, and not try to be as subjective as possible, to try to be inside, the, the, the close to the main character's point of view. I will say that um, the two first movies I made, specifically the second one, My Strong, was quite arrogant and disconnected and uh, uh, was at the time the most su successful things I'd done. <laughs> and uh, for me, in the same time, a, a big failure because I felt that I, I, the movie didn't convey what I wanted to talk about. So it's like a disconnection between ideas and how I was using the, the cinema, the language. That's why I stopped, because after my storm, I said, I'm not a filmmaker. I just want someone that wants to show off with a camera, and I, I can't use the language properly, and I, I don't know what I'm doing, really. So I stopped, and I said, the next time I will take the camera, it will be for something that is really meaningful, and that I will, I will feel that uh, I, I am. So it's true that Polytechnic is a movie that is aesthetically different, and it when you, it's a, for me it's a very strange uh, project because it feels like a, an attempt to use different ways of uh, storytelling and, and uh, uh, camera work. Did you have so, any influences on doing that film? I mean, it, it, on the one hand, it feels f in a strange way it's got a sort of stylization to it, but it also on the other hand it feels more akin to like Fred Wiseman or, or you know. My main, my, the main influence I would say when I was making this movie, it's true that part of it is very stylized and that came from the, the study of space and, and uh, that I was doing with the cinematographer at the time. And I think that's one of the, I would say, um, uh, I learned so much during that movie. Uh, maybe it's a movie I should do again later in my life when I want, uh, when I'm be more in control of what I'm doing. But I will say that the, 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 we were aiming to, at the time, to find the, uh, the poetry that inspired us, uh, the poetry of the movies made by a filmmaker like Michel Bon, a documentary filmmaker, uh, Pierre yeah. Perrault, that, that the two filmmakers that had the big influence on me. Uh, I'm not saying my cinema has nothing to do with them, but still today when I'm, I'm working, it's a sensibility that is very close to I was raised with and that uh, I had a big impact on me uh, how to approach uh, a kind of uh, beautiful humility in the way they approach subjects and the beautiful strength about natural light, which I, I'm not saying Polytechnic does, but it was, I think, some scenes in the movie have, have, have that kind of uh, beauty and are closer to this idea of that kind of, of uh, poetry. but. Uh, other part of it is, is very stylized, you're right. It's a very difficult film. I mean, a very difficult film to do and a very hard subject. Um, why Why in particular that? I mean, for people that don't know, it's a, a high school shooting, right? It's, a, uh, it's an event that happened when I was a film student in 1989. There was a what is known as the first... Uh, school shooting in history. There was a, one event in Texas before a sniper, in the, I think in the 70s, but uh, it was the first time that uh, someone was getting inside an institution like a school and was shooting. And, and the thing is that the killer was only targeted uh, women. And it's an, an event that was very horrific mm. and really disturbing. And that was a big, uh, had a massive shockwave in Canada. The thing is that I, I was approached by a, a young uh, actress that uh, wanted to uh, create a project in the memory of the victims and to approach the movies 
from the student's point of view because the students were judged by the way they reacted uh, when the man started to shoot. And um, there was a lot of uh, judgment, a lot of... Uh, it's an event that created a lot of pain everywhere. And myself, I, uh, I realized that it's a, an event that when it happened, it was so uh, horrific that I shut down and I, I didn't want into the emotions and I didn't explore what it meant to me and what the, uh, to be a man in a society where a man would go and uh, target women, how misogynistic the society can be, the place of women in society, the place of, of women in power. And I was, uh, my two first features were about uh, women characters. I was attracted uh, about femininity, about to explore the place of women in society. So it felt that it's a project that was put upon my shoulder and I didn't say no. It was like, a, a, for me, it was a very, very meaningful movie. It was, uh, everybody uh, in Canada freaked out when they said we would make a movie about that because they felt it was like a taboo subject. But I felt that there was a, a powerful exploration of what it, does it mean. Uh, How long was it after the actual event that you were making the movie? 20 years, 20 years. And uh, it felt uh, uh, a big responsibility, but it's, it's exactly the kind of movie I wanted to make, meaning the kind of subject, mm. it's the kind of something that will I will really make something for other people, something that will be an act of generosity, another act of... of uh, Frankly, I see this movie, I, I, I haven't watched it uh, in a long time. I feel that it's a movie that uh, has is, uh, uh, some strength in about uh, where the camera is, about what it, it shows us to be with the students, because it, all the images we had seen before were from the police point of view or the, the safety point of view, the teachers, but not from the people who actually went through it. And it's something that, uh, so it was a massive research. And uh, the movie was very well received, my great uh, uh, relief. But I think uh, aesthetically, there's a we've made mistakes in this movie. Honestly, yeah. if, uh, if there's a lot of it uh, aesthetically. It's uh, there's sometimes uh, there's a we were focusing on trying to control things, and it was a mistake. <laughs> and okay, so then then you moved on to Ensemble. How did that come about? So, incendie is, is a. When I stop uh, after my astrum, I said to myself, "I'll take a camera again." When, when I had feel and and the, the, I saw a play a few years later, three or four years later, uh, I went out and I saw that play uh, incendie written by Wajimawa that is really a, a masterpiece about how. Uh, uh, Anger is given from one generation to the other and, and uh, how to get rid of it. And it's a subject that I was really exploring myself at the time. And it's like uh, as much the geography of the, the movie was very far away from me, Lebanon, as much I felt a, a strong attraction uh, through this project. And I got the rights myself and I we. I wrote the screenplay for a long period of time. As I was writing Essence, I was offered Polytechnic and the, the way the things were, I did Polytechnic first, but I was doing both movies at the same time. And I would say that uh, um, Essence is, uh, that's where for the very first time, I felt I, it's, it was an act of trying to just follow a pure impulse, uh, with my relationship with the mise en the camera, not trying mm -hmm. to do like what I've seen before, not, not trying to be influenced by something else, just trying to be deeply honest with the camera and not and, and generous with the camera. And, and it's um, it's the first time I felt home doing a sound. It's the first movie oh. that I said, oh, I, I hear it. I don't know what the other people will think if it's boring for them or whatever, but I feel that that's the kind of image and that's the way I, I, I feel. Not I'm not not through the whole movie, but there was something I feel very close. It's by far one of the closest movie I've made, uh, and and uh, to myself and and uh, and it's something in the images the way there's something that uh, I feel that there's a, a parenthood I will say between Ensanzi, the style of Ensanzi and Prisoners, and Sicario, and Blade Runner for me. Mm -hmm. Movies are like linked. Yeah. 
uh, uh, stylistically, mm -hmm. and I, it's movies where the I feel that the camera work. Uh, there's something where I feel home. I don't know how to say that. Otherwise. Yeah, yeah. That I feel. That. I also think. I mean, there's a link with each of them that you're delving into something deeper about. Okay, pretentious. The human condition. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're dealing uh, with anger and loss and regret. Um, that seems to be what draws you to films before the whole visual interpretation oh am i wrong <laughs> no no you're, you're right uh, roger because it, it is the, the that's the way i was able to go back to cinema it was uh, to to it was by the intimate link with the my intimate link with the subject and and then i i know how to to direct then i know how to talk to actors then i know how to interact with the cinematographer i think if i don't have that link uh, i'm uh, useless as a, as a film director I wish I would be other uh, different, uh, be rich, and I would be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you don't no. wish that. <laughs> no, but, but, no, but, no. Uh, it's true. It's like, uh, and uh, that's why after my two first feature film, where I didn't have that uh, uh, connection, when I didn't have that, uh, I was approaching the cinema in a more, I would say, maybe playful way, but it was a more a superficial way than my two first feature, and I had to stop. It was not. Uh, it was like a st sterile, sterile way mm -hmm. of making yeah. cinema. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it has to have a deep, uh, deep, deep meaning and a deep. Uh, uh, is it the same for you, uh, uh, Roger? When you work with a project, and uh, that you have to find your something like uh, where you connect. Uh, I always feel that. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why I love working with you because <laughs> I mean, we do have a similar sensibility and a feel for things i think i mean and not just mean visually i mean actually the the content you know yeah i mean i i can't you can't put that much energy yeah you and... can't put yourself into it unless you kind of feel for the story and the characters and what the film's got to say that's, that's what it's I what feel makes anyway. it worthwhile yeah, it because it otherwise worthwhile, it's yeah. just a otherwise slog. it's just images on the screen i don't care about just making images i mean in, in my own work even when i'm just taking still photographs i mean i've only probably taken 60 still photographs i like in my life because nothing really kind of connects you know what i mean you're really searching for something that connects that actually makes you feel something <laughs> you know what i mean roger do you feel sometimes uh, uh, do you have a feeling of repetition sometimes with the language when you work are you always because it's something that i feel with you that is like uh, uh because you have definitely of course a style but I feel that each shot, you have a way to... Uh, I always feel that you're doing the shot like if it was the first time you were doing it. And the still, it's part of a, a, a real style, a real approach. And I was wondering how you feel inside you. Yeah. Were. I don't know. It, I mean, it always kind of... I mean, it always does feel like the first time, really. I mean, it is, because every, everything you do, it's different, isn't it? I mean, otherwise... I mean, I went once... I've told this before. I once went to an interview with a director, and they said okay, I'm doing this film, I want it to look just like Shawshank Redemption, you know what I mean? So there's... <laughs> Couldn't uh, get out of the door starter, fast enough. It? You know what I mean? Because, <laughs> because the image comes from the script and comes from you and comes from all the other things that are happening around you at the time, doesn't it? You know, it comes from sitting and working on storyboards and then on the day with the actors and and you don't know where it's going. I find that's what... I mean, you have an idea where you want to go, but you don't really know what the shot is and where the, where it's going, the look of the film, until it's actually there and happening and all those people are together with the actors and the sets and, and then suddenly the camera rolls and you think, oh, that's what it's really going to look like. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's what's so exciting, isn't it? I mean... Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Yes, yes. There's chaos of life always brings something. New. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I certainly couldn't work on a film if i didn't connect to the the story of the subject somehow you know but did you uh because me uh, uh, as a director i'm like if i would like uh, as an example if i work with you i'll be in a position where i'm gonna learn i'm gonna be in a position where every shot every day i'm gonna learn something about filmmaking I'm in a learning process working with you, and it's like a, a very rewarding and exciting. You uh, being, a, do you have that uh, feeling that you're still learning? Or are you more? Uh, yes. I, I was just going to say you could turn that around. I could be saying that 
to you, of course, couldn't I? Obviously. Right now, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, doing a VFX on Dune. And I, mm -hmm. I found myself talking about light and asking for things. And I'm like, I, I know it's Roger. <laughs> no, but I know that I can do things. Or I know that uh, I, I realize uh, how much sometimes I, uh, I uh, the amount of things I learn is insane. Yeah. I'm not saying, uh, the, uh, I don't know if you will agree when you're going to see the thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but it's just that I know that uh, it, uh, it's a uh, sensibility towards light that I, I uh, definitely I strongly uh, increased a lot uh, being in the uh, new and working on Blade Runner. And uh, the, it was a really a very, very formative experience. Very, very. To design the movie from the storyboards until the very end by your side, it's insane the amount of things I learned. Insane. Insane. Well, I, I said, again, I could say exactly the same. I mean, it was an insane experience. <laughs> and, you know, let's be honest, it had its ups and downs, but it was pretty amazing experience. Mm. I mean, yeah, life experience. Let's go back a little bit. How did Prisoners kind of occur after yes. On Sandy? And what attracted you to it? And, and how did you feel about working in America. I, can you talk about that, the, 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 the variation? You know? uh, I, didn't, I didn't have the desire to work uh, in Hollywood because I was afraid of the Hollywood system. I was afraid that I had heard all those stories. And I, I, in Canada, we don't have a lot of money, but we have total freedom. And for me, it was something that was very precious. And, uh, and uh, here, you, you cannot make a lot of movies. So you have to, it's a, it's a system that is uh, based on government funds. So you have to, mm -hmm. take, to wait for your turn. It's a, it's a bit a long process, but still, when you make the movie, you're total in command. And, but uh, after Polytechnic, when I, the, the movie was shown in Cannes Film Festival, and then I started to have a, um, receive a, a request for from agencies in Hollywood, and I said to my and I didn't know who to work with. I don't I didn't know, and at one point I remember I I, I, I choose people that uh, I um, by intuition thing and just saying to myself if ever i want to work with an actor later maybe they, it could be useful and and they started to send me screenplays and i was impressed by the quality of the screenplays i was like trying to write my, myself on my corner i was trying to write i was like i felt that, that there was another level of uh, mastery and and, uh, and one of the first uh, that I was sent to me was prisoners and uh, I remember reading it. There was things in it that I deeply love and things that I hate. I was like, I, I'm not sure it's a, it's a project. First of all, I was not uh, seeing myself uh, uh, doing a, a dark thriller like that. I was not, uh, and it, it's, uh, but there was something about it and, and the way this uh, depiction of cycle of violence and, uh, uh, and the ambiguity of, of uh, where uh, it was uh, putting the audience in relationship with this this ambiguity of towards violence and what will you do when it's come close and the honesty of that uh, there was something kind of honest about it that uh, and uh, but I put it on the back and I I was doing a at the time I think and I was like uh, but it came it was keep coming back and keep coming back and and it was very strange I I read tons of screenplays but that's the one. And at one, I, I said to myself, what's happening with that? And I met the, pro the producer. And when I met them, I, I was saying, uh, uh, the gentleman at Alcon, I said to myself, I was invited into LA and I said, I will go there like a, a cultural experience. Once in my life, I will meet the famous Hollywood executive and I will be <laughs> in the same room and I will experience that and I will, it will be interesting. And uh, so I was, I had nothing to lose. So I was very honest. I remember <laughs> them looking at me with eyes and I was <laughs> seeing how well I would approach the story, what was important for me in that story, what it meant to me and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, what I didn't like at all and what will the strength and how I will do it. And uh, I shook all their hands and then I went back in the plane and saying to myself, uh, it's a, it was a nice adventure. <laughs> and uh, I remember just before the plane taking off, my agent calling me saying to me, Hey, you got your first uh, 
Ah. <laughs> 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 and honestly, I was like, uh, I was, uh, I, when the, uh, he said to me, it's, it's uh, your first $50 million movie, I, I freaked out because I never asked what will be the budget. <laughs> 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 I don't think I would have gone to the, 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 the <laughs> meeting if yeah. I knew how much money that they were ready to put in yeah. that. I was like, uh, no, but it's, it's uh, I went into the project very being very, I had very straightforward. It started with a very straightforward relationship. First of all, my English was even worse than right now. So my <laughs> my vocabulary was very uh, um, bold, let's say. So it was when I was expressing myself, it was black and white. There was not, not a lot of nuances. <laughs> no the, gray. No gray. And the producer felt very comfortable with that approach. <laughs> <laughs> Thank and, goodness. And, and, and um, first I was very... Uh, inspired by the story but i also I was deeply moved by the artist i will work with first i mean you roger i mean the fact that you came to the project i remember again a meeting where i was going to meet with a cinematographer and uh, someone someone called me calling me asking me if i would agree to 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 meet an additional cinematographer and it was you and i, I thought it was a joke at the beginning i think it's like so <laughs> it's, it's it's no but it's just that um for me, I went to do prisoners one single experience again, saying to myself, it's an insane chance. One of my biggest dreams as a filmmaker was to work with a, a master cinematographer, work with someone that I admire and that to, just to have the chance to work with a master, just to have the chance to share and ideas and to interact with someone that is, uh, 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 has a knowledge of cinema that is far bigger than mine. And just for me, to, it was very selfish, you know? It was a, 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 a and prisoner became that gift, and I, I was like very excited. But I was like I remember uh, uh, I brought in the, and this adventure also the production designer Patrice Vermet from Montreal and a, a friend of mine and word. And I remember when the plane take, took off to go to do prisoner, we said to ourselves. We might get back to Montreal in three weeks. <laughs> they would maybe <laughs> kick us out, <laughs> but at least we worked it right. And, and uh, uh, to my great surprise, Prisoners uh, became probably the most beautiful film experience, where I felt that uh, the production team, I really felt honestly that they were trying their best to give me all the tools and the elements mm. yeah. needed to make very supportive. Mm. And yeah. I never, yeah. never felt respected like that as a filmmaker. And I felt also, I remember showing them the director's cut and they just shook my hands and said, that's it, you're done. It's, it's a you. Yeah, I was, think, uh, I was thinking that there will be struggling and, and uh, struggles and that it will be, no, it was like, honestly, it was a very, uh, of course there was challenges, there was difficulties, there were, mm. but on mm. the, the, the project itself, uh, I came back home saying, wow, First of all, I met great artists. I learned like never before. I felt I was able to be myself with the camera, stay, keep my identity alive. Martin Scorsese had warned me saying, try to stay intact when you go. <laughs> and I came back and I felt, uh, so uh, to my big surprise, I felt in, totally in love with uh, the American film industry. <laughs> <laughs> I was well, in love. Yeah, I, was, yeah, I was yeah. in love with the film cinema, American cinema as an yeah. audience. But to work with Americans, I was afraid. Yeah. And, uh, it was like a, uh, I'm still there. You were really lucky that your first experience was with Andrew and Broderick because they were so supportive, and they are so supportive mm. as producers, which was great. And remember how we ended up shooting two endings, one that we liked, one that they wanted for safety. And they said, whichever tested higher, they would put in and they stood by their word. Yeah. And the, in fact, it was, it was a, not higher, but if equal, they would yes. choose mine. They, 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 in fact, the, 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 they didn't change the edit, but the, the ending is true. There was two endings because the first, they felt that uh, my idea, which I think was closer to the screenplay, by the way, Fell uh, yeah. <laughs> was not maybe was too much depressing or not commercial enough oh, or something, was, and and uh, <laughs> I, certainly I, dark, I think, yeah, yeah. And, 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 <laughs> which is why we liked it. And I remember they, they we tested both, and Andrew came to me and said he said they scored equally. Maybe yours is better, so we will go with yours. And I, I, I uh, yeah, it was a uh, you know beautiful experience. That was an interesting 
project I felt when I obviously we had met that time at the Academy. And for En Sandy when you I'd got seen, nominated for yeah, foreign film. I'd, we'd seen En Sandy. Um, and it was only when I heard that you would be coming to America to do the film Prisoners, our agent sent the script over. And I think if I'd read that script, not knowing you were going to direct it, I would have really had maybe doubts about working on it. It could have gone anyway. Yeah, because huh? don't you feel, I mean, you read it and obviously you come into it, but for somebody like myself, cinematographer reading it, wondering how a director would go with that project. I mean, it could have gone very kind of gothic, you know, and, and but knowing your work, I felt, you know, I thought On Sandy was an incredible movie. I still do. And knowing that was your sensibility and uh, having just had those brief conversations with you, I, I mean, I knew where you were going right then without you having to really explain it. It was a it was a delicate project uh, from uh, yeah. uh, it, I think it was the same with Sicario too where it was a very where morality uh, you have a responsibility as a filmmaker uh, about what you're saying about reality and it's like it, th those projects were dealing with shadows you know it's like but but what was mm -hmm. it, that what uh, attracted me to these projects and I think that as the, the next movie we've done together Sicario is again one of my be most beautiful. Uh, um, cinema experience because I felt that it uh, for several reasons several reasons one of them was I felt that the budget and the the, um, the movie were just right uh, uh, that they, we were making good decisions and uh, it was a nice puzzle to make yeah I remember on Sicario when we were shooting in that house where th they found all the bodies and you looked at one point and there was a stream of light coming in the window and there was the dust going in and you said, oh, let's shoot the dust, let's shoot the dust, which re reoccurs every so often in the movie. Did that just come to you on the day? Uh, it's a good question, James. The thing is that I know that uh, uh, um, I was a very... Uh, all filmmakers are dreamers, eh? so uh, I spent uh, days reading books when I was a kid or, or watching dust floating in the sunlight <laughs> for me it was a way to feel uh, to, to bring a reality close to me i think to, 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 to something an image that uh, uh, is linked with my childhood uh, i felt was like uh, um, a good way to uh, but i think the idea of the shadow coming in front of the of the window is something that was designed in, in the storyboards i think if memory is good mm -hmm. oh, but just wondering about sicario what is your best memory about it and what do you regret about it i mean it was interesting that the opening of the film changed didn't it in the cut for instance my best memory of it uh, i will say uh, i will say that the joy uh, i remember going with you on the bridge in El pa between el paso and juarez to cross that bridge and to see the size of it it's like a, a monster of, of a bridge and feeling overwhelmed by the, the scope of what it meant to shoot a, a scene that will happen in such a place. And I think that uh, to find a way to design a, a, a piece of a set, use a helicopter shot, to, the way we were able to reconstruct that reality and make it uh, uh, tangible, uh, uh, real, and, and uh, that uh, the whole pieces together that that whole process of re, uh, uh, i think that for me is something that uh, uh i was pretty i felt still pretty excited um the idea of shooting in total darkness with you too <laughs> <It's a thing. laughs> yeah remember, that was kind of funny yeah, yeah. I will remember that was all, funny uh, all my life uh I, <laughs> I i feel that uh the thing i will regret i will say that sometimes i change some dialogues too much i think uh, or there's scenes, the scene in the bar, I feel, is a, a little bit weaker because I went from something more spontaneous with the actors. And I, I remember really on that day, I was sick. The thing, as a director, when you shoot, you have to be in the same way as a, for a cinematographer, I guess. And it's like you have to be at your best every day. And it's not true. Someday yeah. you're bad. And, and, and you remember those <laughs> days are very painful. And the bar scene, I remember I was uh, doing fever or something. I was sick and I was not, mm, I felt mm, that I, 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 
was not able to give the best of myself and I was rewriting dialogues with the actors on the spot and I remember I, uh, they were doing their best and they did a good job but it's just I feel that it could have been a bit more uh, there was something uh, yeah maybe not achieved there in that scene that's I would say uh, yeah but do you do you I mean, we've done a lot of prep together, both, well, first on Prisoners and Sicario, we did a lot of storyboarding, and on Blade Runner, even more storyboarding than on either of those. Do you like having a lot of prep? Do you like having kind of a, a roadmap of what you're going to do? And how do you relate to that on the set with the actors? The thing is that uh, I, I, uh, at, the, at the beginning of uh, when I was making film uh, uh, earlier, I, I, I was really in love with the spontaneity of the camera. And I was really in love with uh, um, coming from documentary to approach to go on set in the morning and to, and the more I, I uh, maybe because the project I'm doing are more and more complex technically too. And there's more and more design and more and more decisions that, I, but so I, I love to more and more to prep. I'm, I, I love more and more to storyboard and that love of storyboarding uh, just uh, uh, increased also uh, uh, before I was doing storyboards only for scenes that are at technical challenges like uh, in the SMZ, the bus attack or things like that when you need to explain to a crew when there are stunts or things like that but the more it goes the more I, I love and more to, to storyboard uh, more and more to find to make sure that the cinematic language is constant to make sure that uh, there's so many decisions that uh, can be made uh, uh, early on, and that uh, it's a relief for me. That I can more focus on the act, on the actors when all those decisions are made. And it's something that I, I felt also. Uh, uh, you were having made a few movies with you. you I felt where it was a, a process that you really love too, and I, I, uh, I, it, I just increased. And uh, movies like Blade Runner and Dune has been entirely storyboarding. And uh, it's just a process that I love just more and more, more and more. The amount of decision you can make at storyboards is uh, fantastic to make. But the, you still have the ability to change on the day, right? Uh, I mean, when you get yeah, into yeah. the set with the actors. It's the key is to be prepared and have a plan and then to throw it in the basket. Yes. <laughs> and mm. that, of yeah. course, how yeah. many times yeah. uh, uh, Roger and I walk on set and uh, I do the blocking and suddenly an actor come with someone, something that was not, uh, he, instead of sitting on the chair, he stand by the desk and uh, 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 we are both spontaneously inspired by their position that are totally different. To what. So when I... I, I I do a blocking with actors. I don't, uh, most of the time, I, I like first to have a very raw and spontaneous blocking that uh, doesn't follow the plan, grosso modo. So we, it's, if there's something that is better, that come, can come up. But they, of course, it's, it's super important. That's why I insist most of the time to have real sets with real environments so the actors can be inspired on the day. And I, honestly, I, I still, Think that most the best thing that I've, I've done in my life most of the time are uh, ideas that came on set in the morning. Uh, 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 as an example, I remember the torture scene we made with Vinicio del Toro. The way he, mm -hmm. he came in the morning with this idea of standing in front of uh, the bad guy, uh, standing in front of him uh, and trying to provoke him in a way that uh, I will have never thought of and it rechanged the scene and we, I, we reconstruct the scene about this Benicio del Toro idea and for me those are my favorite moments yeah and one of the I will say this Roger you asked me a question about one of my favorite moments of Sicario I will say that it's probably the final scene between Benicio and uh, Emily why because it's a scene that was literally written differently in the movie and uh, for several reasons, I, I uh, decided to rewrote it, and it, the, I was influenced by uh, uh, deeply influenced by uh, an idea from Benicio, which was the the idea of the letter. Then I was like really influenced by this idea of Emily, who decided to stay sit during the scene, sitting on the on the, the at the table. But it was not at all the way I was seeing the scene. And then by the way, you approach it with light. With created the scene for me where Benicio is backlit and, and urge is like 
even leave it like it's, there's something about the conflict of the movie that is expressed through light in that moment that I thought was be, became from total teamwork. And it's by far one of my favorite scenes of the movie. And I, it's a, a scene that was constructed entirely from everybody, everybody's ideas. It's not, I cannot say my biggest joy as a director when I, is when I feel that I brought everybody in a place where everybody brings the best of themselves, if I, if I can say. It's a bit ironic, yeah. mm-hmm. but, but yeah. I feel that yeah. I feel something like it's yeah. more like a channel than something. And then when this yeah. happens, sometimes there's a lot of strength with a beautiful cinematic idea. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, that's also probably I've said before. I think that's my favorite scene in the film. I know, uh, I didn't and, know that. Yeah, yeah, because it's so simple, and I think that that uh, yeah, as you say, Benicia brought so much to it as well, didn't he? That sort of minimalism about what he was doing, uh, and uh, sometimes me. the simplicity is so much better than. Then the, the the script. There was a lot of dialogue in the script. I remember. Yeah, it was page. Uh, uh, it, it it was a very different scene, and I'm yeah. sure that if uh, uh, Taylor Sheridan has directed it himself, it would have been different and probably uh, uh, very interesting. But it's like uh, it. I felt it's a scene that I'm I'm proud of, and and that um, very uh, there's a. It's for me, it's cinema, and it's like a, a, the, the the we. Are, Sim- this, that simplicity of the language you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's interesting that we're both talking about a scene that's two people sitting at a table in a kitchen on a set <laughs> that <laughs> co- cost about 10 grand, you know. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's all the rest of the film, people on the bridge at El Paso and, the, you know, the <laughs> the traveling through Mexico City and the whole bit. But we're talking about one little scene of two people sitting at a little Kitchen table. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. has an intensity and there's a, a equilibrium between the acting and the way yeah. the actors are moving into light. That is yeah. so strong. It's one of, it's one of my I think it's probably one of my favorite scenes we've done together, Roger. Mm. That, that scene is like mm. uh, yeah. Yeah, it's funny when those things work. It's the little things, isn't it? I've always said, I mean I always say I just love photographing a human face you know and then when you've got somebody like emily and benicia <laughs> you know yeah that's quite something Denny, i think one of the the best things about prisoners and sicario is how well you build tension it's not fancy it's not too drawn out but you do such an excellent job at keeping somebody guessing but then pulling the trigger at the right moment and building the tension and then having it come to like talk about how you kind of go about designing those in your head or story points and making sure the script really hits, whether it's in the edit or while you're directing the actors or just tension moments? It's a very good question. And it's an, uh, uh, I thank you. And then my answer would be very embarrassing. I remember <laughs> when I did my first uh, uh, short film, professional short film in Jamaica, there's a scene where a character is driving into a, a neighborhood that uh, feels unsafe. And uh, I remember friends, coming out of the theater at the end of the, project, the screening, saying to me, man, that was tense. I said, really? I was like, uh, I, I was so happy it worked <laughs> out. The, the cinema is very powerful, <laughs> but it's like, it's honestly purely an intuitive process of how to create how, where the tension rises in the shot, the length and the rhythm that you need to in, uh, incorporate in the shot and uh, it's still today it's uh, uh, when I try to intellectualize it or try to find a recipe or I always come uh, frankly with the boring answers and the truth is I don't know <laughs> I just <laughs> say there's something about that it's, it's just a, a matter of uh, uh, using when I Maybe I'm a, someone that is dealing in a daily basis with a lot of anxiety. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, and um, it's something that uh, I would think about your question, but uh, it's every time I'm being asked, I feel that when I try to explain, it's uh, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's a matter of a sensibility, I think. It's, so, yeah, I think that's what I was going to say. I think it's sensibility, and you have a uncanny knack of knowing when a wide shot will hold and when yes. you hold it so long 
it starts to mean something else. Yeah, 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 it, yeah, yeah. It's no longer just a, an establishing shot. It comes becomes something else. And if the camera's moving in slowly or you're pushing into a tree, it actually means much more than actually visually what's in the frame. And something you can't even put you know, into words. The, yeah. There's one particular scene in Sicaria that people ask me a lot about, which is, is the scene between Josh and Emily after they come back across the border and all the all the um, SUVs pull to a halt. They get out and they have that argument mm -hmm. and it's all played in the wide shot. And I've said the wide shot was only the shot we had made for the convoy pulling up and them getting out. In the storyboard. In the storyboards. And I thought when we set it up, we said, okay, we'll think about coverage if we need it after. And you let that, take play during that conversation that argument and they're kind of small figures in the distance and i remember after you were happy with the take i said to you shall we go in for coverage should we do overs and you said no i think you said no if we did that i might be forced to use it yeah the, the and we moved inside right we moved inside and can you tell us a little bit about your thought process there? I think that the, the, there's a there's a, 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 a dictatorship of the close-ups in the cinema. More the cinema evolves, the more we are getting mm -hmm. closer and closer. And the thing, it's beautiful. I love the power of close-ups, but uh, there's something about seeing the characters and the landscape and their relationship with space. And I, uh, I remember I had done a shot like that in a sound scene where I shot both characters, the twins, they come out at the beginning of the movie, that the, there's a brother and a sister, and they just learn a terrible news, an incredible news. They have a father alive somewhere, and they, they cannot believe, and a brother. And they, it's a, a news that is so big, and I, I wanted to express their vulner, vulnerability, and how they feel small in the world. And I remember doing that white shirt, and I said, that's it, it's there. Everything is there. And the next thing I've done, I said to the cinematographer, knowing deep in my heart that I got everything I needed, I said, let's do coverage. And I hated <laughs> myself. I, I every shot yeah. after that, I was doing the shot. I said, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Why? I, I'm a coward right now. I, I, I don't follow my instinct. I know I don't need to do this. And it's a movie that was shot with not a lot of money. So I, it was like a, a precious time, precious, uh, and I, 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 and I felt that I, I didn't knew where to go with the camera after it was a mess, and I was angry at myself, and I said never again, never. When I would feel that 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 feeling, that uh, so when it happened on, on uh, Sicario, which in fact was like a similar uh, 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 moment where a character would feel that uh, going back to America after being in Mexico, being in a relationship with the American landscape, with that flag on top of them, and the way. The first take, I remember, I said, my God, the way her body moves in space is so beautiful. She's expressing so much things right now that uh, will disappear in the close-up. I felt that uh, uh, it, it felt everything is there, and I, I, I followed the promise. I said, <laughs> <laughs> that's what the, the, the decision was made. But it's just, there's something about vulnerability of a, a character in the landscape that uh, uh, cannot translate in a close-up, and it's like... A, a, uh, I thought the shot was cinematically meaningful, seeing all the group of men going back inside the, the, the building and leaving her behind. Uh, and uh, there was something uh, yeah, quite powerful. I think it's very interesting, too, like talking about that. And Roger, if you remember, we've talked about before people always asking for something more from meaning behind a shot or like, no, 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 there must be some reason why you did it. And Denis, like, it's, it's about, I think a lot of times as a filmmaker, getting enough confidence to trust your instincts and understand where something's coming from. And there might, sometimes you do search for more meaning and themes and whatnot, but um, understanding that you have to trust yourself sometimes too, and not always need a deeper reason to do it. Yeah. And, and, uh, and uh, take risk. And uh, the, uh, with uh, Greg Fraser, I'm doing, we developed a, a, an expression. Uh, he said that uh, when Cortez uh, landed in, uh, in America, he burned the boat. So the, the, the guys <laughs> would not come back. So we said, that's what the expression, yeah. let's burn the boat. When we burn yeah. the boat, yeah. we burn the boat. I mean, we just go and uh, you, you take the risk of, uh, 
the, 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 there was another reason why I did that also is that it's because we were, I knew that we will be out of a car. we will be inside a car for 12 minutes being in close up on Emily Blunt. For, and I thought that, uh, it made total sense cinematically to open at that moment. Like suddenly the character is like having a wave of oxygen, you know, a lot of oxygen coming yeah. to her and being able to release the anger. So it felt more proper to do that in the white shot. Yeah. I think, you know, to to Matt's point though, you have to trust that you, your relationship with the shot is going to be the same. Is that is the way it's going to translate to the audience, right? You look at a shot like that, you see those little figures. It's almost like leaving that argument in a private moment or something. Just, anyway, whatever your relationship is to the shot and what it, you feel from it, that's, you hope, is what the audience is going to feel. So it's really an instinctive thing, isn't it? Totally. And there's also something about the character of Emily Blunt being left behind and mm. uh, feeling powerless and uh, feeling, uh, uh, how can I say, naked in this landscape. There's something that I mm. think was proper there. About the, the, the mm. tension, and uh, I will say that uh, when you said, Roger, that polytechnic, there was like different camera style or something was very aesthetic sometimes. It's true. I, th I think it's like, uh, I will say it was very, it was very, um, a very experimental movie. Uh, as a director, there was like, uh, I was not conscious of that. As I was shooting, uh, uh, we were using uh, squibs, bullet squibs. And sometimes because of the amount of extra, we, uh, I remember a shot I was doing, shooting an actress beside a, a Xerox machine. And we had to let, for several reasons, let the action roll for two minutes or a minute and a half before the actual squib, because for continuity with the, and, I remember the amount of uh, what was happening, the tension that was rising in that shot. That I was not, it was not planned. It, it, it was like a pre roll of a. So I started in that movie to let the camera roll before the action and a long time after, sometimes letting it just because there was something. The, sh the shot sometimes started to mean something different because mm -hmm. I was letting it rolling after. And the meaning, there was a weight or a tension that. So that uh, it's it's all started there to you how to use time and how, where to stretch and I was uh, starting to play with that live uh, uh, when I was doing polytechnic. So to answer to your question about the uh, uh, yeah tension, sometimes uh, it's something that can uh, has to be done as you're shooting. You feel it as you're shooting. It's not in the editing room. I was. Mm. It's interesting. The first shot in Apocalypse Now was a second yeah. unit shot of a, an explosion in the palm trees. Mm. And the camera was running for, I don't know, a minute or two minutes before the effects went off. And they've used that in the front <laughs> shot. <laughs> Just the sound of the helicopters coming and, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I strongly believe in, in that, frankly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Do you want to talk a little bit about Blade Runner? Pros that your process on Blade yeah. Runner. What is it with you and science fiction? You you seem to now <laughs> turn to science fiction. Are you ever going to do anything else? I I I I, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't turn to science fiction. I went away from yeah. it. It's very different. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I was like in love with uh, science fiction as a kid. Uh, there was something about uh, uh, because of the reality around me. I was like I was born in a very small village where. I won't go into details, but the thing is that it's it's uh, there was something about uh, uh, the dream quality of science fiction as a kid that I was very really attracted to, and uh, the fact that you were able to approach subject matter that was quite sometimes very dark or very uh, controversial. And in science fiction, you cannot approach those subjects because you are not. Uh, uh, it's a, in a different context, so it's like a. I, I, uh, always, I was always dreaming to do science fiction, but science fiction is not something I can't really do at home because it means a uh, bigger budget. So when I came to uh, Los Angeles, when people started to ask me, what would you really would love to do as you are here? As a, uh, I would love to do a science, I would love to try to do a science fiction movie one day. I'm happy to talk uh, about Blade Runner with you both, uh, the, the, the three of you, sorry. But it's a, it's a movie that I was not able to watch again. <laughs> it takes a time before uh, being able to yes. digest, 
to make peace yes. with the, the, the it's, it's very str- I don't know about you guys but the, the, the uh, mm. for me when I make a movie there's a lot of deep joy pain anger linked with the process <laughs> and when I, it's finished it's just like okay it's done and I, it takes me years before I'm able to uh, watch it again and to see the movie for what it is uh, uh, truly and uh, so I'm not there yet with Blade Runner but uh, I will say that the um, we know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. And I would yeah. say that the, for, for me, that is something that is very singular about this film experience was to storyboard uh, the movie with you, Roger and James, uh, very early on to bring you in the process of uh, the, the creative process very early on. Like, I, I don't think I ever done that with a cinematographer like that before. And it was a big joy to dream together about the movie. Because yes. what we we we, mm. we storyboarded, we technically we, we rewrote the movie uh, a lot of things together. We design a lot of things together. We we dream about the architecture, about the textures, about the the, the, the atmospheres, about the way we lit the movie, about the, the logic of things. The, um, and there's a lot of things that that was, and uh, it's still to this day. Uh, it's by far one of my favorite. Moment of the film process was storyboarding Blade Runner. That was really for me a moment that uh, there was so much freedom there, and and uh, it was like to share that. Uh, yeah, it was uh, awesome. It was great too because to have the amount of time just to be able to think slowly, not have to come to decisions every day, but just to go through all the possibilities and then figure out what it was. I think that I, I sorry Roger. I think that I really love also about. Uh, that film was, I felt it, it, there was a kind of equilibrium between very old cinematic and, and uh, uh, CGI. They, to use uh, very, the way you, you approach atmosphere, creating those landscapes. Probably the, my favorite sets in Blade Runner are the ones that don't exist. <laughs> 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 that that, that, that uh, oh, yeah. beautiful uh, uh, desert infinite desert that you designed with the uh, atmosphere and the in a, in a stay on stage for me it's something that uh, it brought a lot of uh, I, re- I really love when cinema is an equilibrium between the very very old, very old tricks and and uh, high-end uh, technology how do you feel about cg i mean can you talk a bit about you know your, your love for having you know, three-dimensional sets and actors in real spaces. The thing is that uh, uh, I've, and I, I experienced it uh, a few times, is when you are in a virtual environment, your relationship with the angles, and even if you try to predict predicts you, that you, 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 you are very well prepared, that you, have, you are still, the ideas are uh, still the design of the shirt are bound to what is in front of you, which is the actor, and you are not in relationship with the, the same way with space. You don't, you, you don't uh, anticipate what the ceiling will look like. And there's a different. Uh, I feel that strongly that it's like um, I'm old fashioned. I need reality. <laughs> I, 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 I like to, uh, and I, it's a thing that I would try to fight for. Uh, uh, until the end, because I feel that uh, it's uh, uh, it's not true that uh, you have the same uh, inspiration, and that the actor or the cinematographer or myself will come with the same idea if there's nothing around us. So it's like uh, it's a uh, numerous time in my life I had the proof that uh, thing the idea comes sometimes just a bit like you said, James. There's dust floating in a sun ray and it did you uh, uh, it's the birth of a shot you know it's it's like a, the, but that you have to to mm-hmm. to see it uh, somewhere before it's uh, it's it's coming from reality i mean uh, so for me cg is great for uh, such extension to to make a impossible vehicle to fly things like that but it it's always needs some ground real place in fact at the end of the day it needs nature it, we are, I think there's nothing, I think Godard said the, the, the biggest strength for a filmmaker, the biggest ally is nature. And I still believe that too, is that you need uh, nature on your side and you cannot emulate nature. Uh, uh, it's something that uh, you need to dance with. You cannot bring it 
out of nowhere. It's like, uh, yeah, that's what I think. That's well put. <laughs> was it hard for you to come from, I don't know how much CG was on Prisoners or Sicario, if it, like intermittently, but uh, was it hard to go on to a set with a much bigger budget and, and, you know, deeply based in or having CG throughout it and have to learn all that? Was it a big learning curve? The thing is that uh, when I was uh, younger, I witnessed filmmaker from uh, own friends of mine that struggle um, when they try to make movies for certain reasons. They try to make to go from a $5 million movie to a 35 or 50 million and uh, spend years because they didn't, didn't have the firepower or the, the, the knowledge or the experience to do that. And I, when I choose projects in my life, it was always because I was able to, there was something, a deep connection or something inspired, deeply inspiring for me about what the screenplay was talking about, but also the size of it. So uh, it was like steps. I would have never done Blade Runner after I saw Z. I've done it after I've done, done four feature films in between that uh, uh, were a step. That uh, so I, I um, and I would have not been able to do Tune before Blade Runner. It's 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 all, it's all uh, like there's a logical uh, that I don't have a career plan, but I have a, <laughs> a safety net under. The, I'm choosing projects <laughs> that I know that. Uh, uh, are uh, that I can, ma- I can I can I can master technically that I can do technically. So it's like uh, uh, that's what I'm gonna say. I was ready when I did Blade Runner. I thought I was ready to do it, yeah, because I had done uh, Arrival just before and Sicario, and uh, there was a fair amount of VFX in the in Sicario to, to reconstruct that border. There was a, and I think it's important. I I, I would not. Myself, I would not be able. Some people are able to do it. Me, I'm not. I, I would not be able to go from uh, making my first feature to making my Blade Runner my second feature. I'll, I'll be dead right now. So, yeah, I would be. Uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> you know. Do you think um, after Dune you might do something that's not science fiction? Frankly, I'm, I'm definitely. Uh, I'm dreaming of doing. Uh, it would be healthy for me to do something small. Seriously, though, I think to go back, uh, yeah. uh, like my daughter said, do enemy the explanation. It would be great to go back in the, in the something of the size of Sicario or something where it's more uh, uh, where I'm not uh, having to dream about uh, uh, the design of a car, the design of a of a, a wallet or a, or a gun for months before shooting it, the way I can just embrace reality for what it is that I would love to to go back there. <laughs> but I have a lot of, uh, I have few other, I deeply love science fiction, yeah. But um, no, I, I'll go back to reality, James, to answer to your question, yeah. Definitely. For my mental sanity, it would be good. Thing. <laughs> when, of course, say, we both share the love of the big screen. We both share the, the love of cinematic experience. And uh, you made a lot of jokes about it sometimes, about my uh, iPhone. Or, but it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's uh, <laughs> uh, to know, to people who doesn't know, it's just that Roger was traumatized because I had a, a thin red line from Terrence Malik on my iPhone. And he thought it was like a horrific. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was cool because it was like having a little notebook and it was having the movie with me. <laughs> it's not the same. But the thing is, is uh, saying that I'm, I want to fight for the big screen at the same time, to be very honest, I realized that a lot of my uh, uh, cinema, big cinema experience, actually, I've been on television. I discovered 2001 A Space Odyssey on television. I did come, and I realized later that I discovered Blade Runner on television. I, dis- I, I discovered a lot of movies that were massive influence, massive traumatic experience, or massive, uh, uh, the old, most of Bergman's, Bergman, Igmar Bergman, what I dif- discovered on VHS. I mean, it's like, and still, I would dis- do these movies had a massive yeah. impact. Yeah. So all that debate about uh, the size yeah. of the screen sometimes I see. Because I'm a filmmaker and I love the cinema, <laughs> yeah. still, how do you feel about that? I, I'm, so, I'm with you, really. I mean, I love the experience of being in a cinema with an audience, but I think it's more imp- the film's more important than that people see them. And if uh, the future people are going to watch movies on television, mm-hmm. that's fine too. 
I, I agree with you. I think most of my the films that I remember from my childhood were from watching them on television, so not not cinema experiences. But uh, I'm almost obligated to ask the uh, TV. I mean, the uh, smartphone question of. Uh, platforms like Quibi or people publishing original content that's now going smaller and smaller. And so, you know, if it's the future, what do you guys think about that? Having content go straight to a phone. But the thing is that uh, uh, it's a very delicate subject matter. It's definitely at the end of the day, cinema is an immersive experience. And, and uh, but again, I would say that uh, say, uh, in my home, I'm trying to have a, a biggest screen as possible if I, I'm going to the, I love that there's nothing like the theatrical experience it's the ultimate experience and I, it will stay the ultimate experience but uh, uh, and uh, uh, I don't know how I say it. I know that people who watch Roma Alfonso Cuaron Roma in a theater had a mm -hmm. very different experience of people who watch it on an iPad the movie was designed to be in to, to the length of the shots it was designed to discover details that the the way the, the shots are designed is to uh, immerse yourself in, in, a, in, a, in a, an environment and to have the time to embrace little details and to be touched by the, the light and the time passing by, which I don't think you can experience on a small screen. You cannot, you don't have that. Uh, so it's like, uh, I don't think that uh, it's, I, where I'm going is that if you shoot for an iPhone, it's a different movie. The relationship with the pacing, with the, uh, the death, with the, you cannot do wide shots uh, it won't have the same impact uh, uh, on an iPhone than uh, on a big screen for sure. The shot of Sicario we're talking about probably makes no sense on an iPhone, but in a cinema is is relevant because you see you uh, see uh, the, the the facial expression. You see still, even in a wide shot, you still see details that are on an iPhone. Won't. And um, yeah, I definitely the way I cut films is, is uh, for the big screen. Not for, uh, I know my films are all in a way, that they, they are made in an old fashioned way for big screens, not for. Uh, yeah. And in the reverse, I'm always traumatized when I see a movie that has been cut for YouTube on a big screen. You feel it, you don't have the time to, you just have a, a blast yeah. of shots that you cannot appreciate or, or being influenced by. Your brain cannot process because it's too fast, because it has been cut for a small screen. You feel it. It's a trend. Yeah. So I. I was talking, I was speaking with my brother the other day, and the only reason I'm asking is because we were talking about Denis, how it was important for you to start realizing thematically and to say something in your films. Um, and he made a point that he was talking to a friend of his about Castaway, and he said, uh, you know, I, I thought there was a ton of symbolism and a lot of themes going on in Castaway. And his friend said, oh, really? I thought it was just about a guy on an island. And his, his point was that a good director can say something much more than just that's in the story. And, you know, for some people, they may see the story as what's just presented to them with the narrative and the, story, the, the screenplay as simple. And then other people will take it to that next level and really see more meaning in it. How important is it for you to have that, you know, symbolism or have themes in it? And how did you develop that relationship to understand and present themes in a deeper way than just something but what you describe is cinema. I mean, it's like uh, the, the art of cinema, an image that uh, uh, you create an image that has a second meaning or a, or a third meaning. It's, it's the, and I did that, do, do I succeed doing that? Sometimes I wish I was doing, I was able to do that all the day and every image is, uh, no, I, uh, some filmmakers are able to do that uh, uh, fluently in all their, it's, a, it's an art form that it's very complex and uh, to, but it's the goal. It's the goal is to create. A, what I, when I say an image is not a, it's not something. It's something you capture. It's what you don't see in in the, with the camera. That uh, uh, the poetry of what you're shooting that has a different uh, uh, meaning. Uh, uh, a bit. A bit. Uh, someone, said, a friend of mine, said uh, they gave a good example. It's like the priest who raised the bread in his hand, saying that's the the Christ. Uh, 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 I don't know how do you say that in English. Body of the Christ, you know, it's, it's, it's a piece of bread that he holds, but it's supposed to be the Christ. That's cinema. <laughs> that's the the, uh, the, the idea of, of, uh, of uh, uh, and uh, that's the deep joy. I mean, uh, of uh, some of my movies, I succeed to make one image in the movie that is a real cinema. The rest is a, 
others are there <laughs> more <laughs> but it's I, I i feel that that's the the ultimate goal i mean it's like a, to it's a normal a good film is a film that has you can see as you rightly said for the the strength of the story and then you can go into the character behaviors and to the politics of what it means and then to a deeper level and it's like a, when you succeed the, you yeah it's it's a, the quest of a lifetime to do that for me the uh, but uh, yeah that's cinema what you described for me but there's also times when people will come up and they'll have read something completely different in it. Oh, I, that scene, I particularly like that you put him in a cold, I mean, in a blue shirt, which shows the coldness of his heart or something. And never was that particularly thought of. So it's always interesting to me to see interpretations come up that we hadn't really thought of at the time. Well, you also wonder if those things, though, are something that comes intuitively so a director or whoever on the set, right. that actually that meaning is there, but they're not consciously aware of mm. <laughs> of creating it that way. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's a, it's a balance. I think that it's like uh, definitely uh, how, many, how many times uh, I read uh, uh, a word from a student on, on one of uh, my project, and I just uh, I, they see things that uh, I was. <laughs> But uh, it's it's true that uh, at one point yeah. I feel a, a producer once said to me that uh, when you make a movie it's like you're a, like a fisherman and uh, in your net you can, you grab fish sometimes that are so the big that you, the idea is to make a beautiful net and when you the, the net there will be fishes that uh, you will catch that are not supposed to be there but are you catch them because you made the net you know so it's like a, it's it's a, 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 <laughs> I think at the end of the day is is the goal is to try to be able to control as much as possible all the elements of the, of the movie. As you said, uh, uh, rightly said, James, uh, the, the, every aspect, aesthetic aspect, uh, the colors and everything and that, but uh, there's always something that slip out of the, your attention and that will be uh, seen by others. As a, so uh, it's a quest. And, and uh, my dear friends, to see you both, uh, it was, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's uh, less uh, entertaining than seeing Roger doing a barbecue. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh, we know that's for sure. <laughs> I can't okay. wait. Be I'm getting better. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Soon, soon in the near future, hopefully, uh, yeah. it will happen again. Thanks for listening. If you want more information and further discussion, check out the forums at www.rogerdeacons.com. Becoming a member is free, and you can ask follow-up questions there. And be sure to subscribe to the podcast for more new questions and topics. Also, check us out on Instagram at team.deacons. See you next time. Thank you.